Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Another solo show this week. Um, I'm getting to like them. Uh, we may end up doing them on a semi-regular basis, because uh, it helps in cohering my thoughts around particular issues. Uh, so I guess that's one of the main reasons. The other is I've been a little unwell this week. Uh, which turned out to be a blessing because it allowed me to ruminate uh, over the course of about five or six, you know, bedridden days as to what I wanted to say and and think about and and really this whole Syria escalation has kind of been squatting in the middle of the road creatively and it's something that should probably be addressed um, rather than ignored. It's proving a little bit too difficult to do so. And to begin, I suppose, well, the Chaos Protocols was written for this time. That's how it got its name. Uh, the publisher initially, when they approached me, wanted a how-to Chaos Magic book. But I said there are enough of them already, and quite frankly, the only good ones are the first ones. Uh, so, you know, we, we stretched my literary ability to its capacity and built a single additional meaning into the title. Funnily enough, one of the rejected titles was Five Minutes to Midnight. And the publisher said that might be unclear to, um, you know, a majority of Americans what that referred to, but I expect it would be a bit clearer now. Anyway, the book opens with a McKenna quote. Um, the problem is not to find the answer, it's to face the answer. And, uh, and that's worth sitting with for a bunch of reasons, the first one being it's true, uh, but, but it's a certain kind of true, which is one that makes you uncomfortable. When these things happen and or if I write a post or a newsletter, um, sometimes the response is, yes, but what do we do? And when I read that, what I hear is people wanting to continue behaving in the way we as a group behave, uh, or individually, and not have the consequences land on us. Because... We do know the answer. It's, it's actually facing it. It's actually looking at it. So if you read, say, last week's newsletter, you'll know that Martin Armstrong's war cycle, whilst it's in an uptrend, doesn't peak for another two and a half years. And it seems to me we're running too hot into that uptrend for it not to get really, really bad. Um, by 2021, when it starts to head into its downtrend. If you think about that particularly awful hour or so on Friday when you sat around waiting to see how Russia would respond to the airstrikes in Syria and whether this was, you know, uh, <laughs> this was the beginning of a nuclear conflagration. Sidebar, Westerners getting a taste of what it's like to live in Syria or Gaza for the last seven years? Well, um, we should expect more of these moments heading into 2021. Now, um, there's just no point going over the he said, he said of the preposterous justification um, for, you know, this violation of international and domestic law when it comes to these ludicrous airstrikes. Um, if you listen to the show which you are right now, you'll know the official story is as fake as throwing flour and red paint on little children and photographing them in the back of ambulances, right? So I don't want to talk about this. Uh, the show isn't going to get caught in that round and round and round of the minutiae. I'm playing bingo with all these false reports at some point yields diminishing returns. You need to be able to look at the nonsense that the British and the Americans and the French and whatever are saying and realize it's nonsense. But then at that point, where, where, where is your upside for going, aha, and then this one said this, but that one said that, and look at these pictures and look at this and so on. Like we kind of know this by now. And funnily enough, uh, in New South Wales, at least when I went to high school, 
Um, you could either do ancient or modern history if you're doing history, right? And modern history ended in 1980, uh, which means you kind of do the story of uh, modern history up to effectively the end of Vietnam. And uh, I have a friend who did modern history and I did ancient history and we would argue about which one was the more important. And obviously I think ancient history was. Uh, but he, funnily enough, has a White House press pass now. He's a journalist. And, uh, and we were talking a few years ago. This was a while ago. I haven't spoken to him in a long time. And, uh, and if you study modern history, particularly when it's, you know, how the Australians got involved in the Vietnam War or so on, it is the story of conspiracy, right? So it turns out that this was a lie or Gulf of Tonkin and, and all this kind of stuff. And I sort of said to him at one point, what do you think happened after 1980? Did our elected officials just suddenly elevate to a new level of morality where they are beyond the corruption and lies of their forebears? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, then when you look at the world and I, I see lies, I see a continuation of uh, the same method of governance that we can kind of study from an historical perspective. And uh, the only difference is that you're kind of here to observe it, which suggests to me that it's your own, which is not him personally, but it's your own kind of almost cognitive arrogance uh, that you know what's going on, that people in the past were duped by uh, Gulf of Tonkin or, or whatever it happens to be and uh, you won't because this time you're here to watch it and and they're saying the right thing or, or so on. It's just, it, it's extremely naive from an historical perspective. So um, this is kind of what I mean about you can go into the detail as much as you want of, uh, you know, the white helmets and, and all this kind of stuff, but Beyond that first initial, this is a lie like the rest of the lies that have been historically used to get us into wars. Um, where, where is your upside? What are you going to do with that information? And it seems to me a bad habit. Uh, it can only further upset you because what is quite clear is accurate information isn't changing the behavior at the top. Or, or the discourse, or so on. So what I think we need to do instead is look at trajectories. Uh, for instance, the balance of power model I've been trying to get people to look at or be interested in is clearly still in play, uh, despite the fact that the Eastern Mediterranean is turning into a car park of military hardware, and the, the Truman Carrier Group hasn't even showed up yet. That's going to be in the next couple of days. But if you look at all this current talk of this so-called Arab force replacing U.S. troops in Syria, and that, <laughs> which is just so many different kinds of racisms rolled into one. I mean, for whatever it's worth, which is probably nothing, um, genetic theory or you know race theory, you know, tells us that Syria is, isn't even Arab um, for the most part. It's an Eastern Mediterranean or Mesopotamian civilization, and those genetics have remained fairly stable since Alexander the Great. So it's that kind of Western military Sykes-Picot uh, delusion that, you know, all these brown people are the same. And yes, for the most part, they're all Muslims, but even that, they're different kinds of Muslims, right? Uh, and thirdly, it's still going to be American guns doing the killing because where does Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Qatar get their weapons from? So uh, nevertheless, what you're seeing is that pivot to disrupting or attempting to shape the integration of Eurasia via imperial satrapy. So uh, it will be the presence of economic and military allies kind of squatting over a, uh, a Russian-Iranian sphere of influence at that end of the Silk Road that they're kind of hoping will give Western powers a foothold into what is effectively inevitable at this point and should be celebrated, which is that integration of the world island, right? So um, the other trajectory, as I mentioned, is the war cycle continues. Uh, and <clears throat> one of the things Martin Armstrong says to explain cycles 
is that they move by human consciousness. So the majority of people think a thing, and as a result, it, it happens, right? Which isn't wrong exactly, but it kind of needs a better magical interpretation slid under it. For instance, where do the thoughts that propel the kind of pendulum move of cycles come from? And it's, it's interesting to watch that because you have, since the election, a shrill majority of liberal centrists effectively arguing for the war that has now landed on our doorstep. So even, and this is a, a, a quite a good example, most people don't think they're wrong, right? That's how the majority of um, consciousness moves all in the one direction. And, uh, and you just look at something like the same day, <laughs> the same day as the Syrian airstrikes was Coachella. <clears throat> so the internet melted down about that. And it's effectively an anti-LGBT group fundraiser. And it was headlined by, I mean, she's an astonishing performer, but she comes out in, in military camouflage. And you think this is, this is how the cycles move. So here are people assuming they're good or, or heading in, in the right direction. And it's, it's very difficult to avoid looking at Martin Armstrong's assertion and taking it very seriously at this point, right? So the question becomes, what do we do individually, people listening to the show, people who are either recovering members of the pendulum swing or aware of the pendulum swing and, swing and working out where they want to position themselves? And, um, and this is what I've been thinking about all week, I suppose. So there is... What I think it comes down to is effectively a Socratic turn. So you, we kind of, listening to the show, I'm very interested in making sure that everyone interrogates and builds their own metaphysics. This is in my books. This is in whatever. But there is a relationship between metaphysics and philosophy that is probably useful here, and it is the Socratic turn. So the pre-Socratics, who I generally prefer, were much more interested in metaphysics in in what the universe even am and once you get with the socratic turn once we get to socrates in particular it's not so much what the world am but how to live in it and a lot of those underlying metaphysics which they don't really talk about are taken as given and that's a useful inspiration for the sort of people who listen to this show because it's some on some level even if it's incomplete to your own satisfaction, you have a wider metaphysics. And, and the question is, what do you build from that? Or how does that inform how you live in the world, right? And, uh, and it seems to me the defining yardstick or the cornerstone of how one lives in the world at the moment is anti-war. Anti-war or nothing, that is the one kind of fixed political, philosophical, whatever you want, position that you should not move from. And this is simply from a risk analysis perspective. Uh, we are, it's been a while, it's been decades since there has been a real risk of essentially turning the entire Northern Hemisphere into a nuclear wasteland, right? Um, everything else falls away from a risk analysis perspective when you realize that. Everything else. Being anti-war is effectively the only issue for the time being. Uh, and we should probably elaborate on that. So during the election in the newsletter, I wrote about the election being effectively about your soul. Uh, because both major candidates were es essentially different kinds of racist fountainheads for the war industry. Uh, and I guess what I meant by it being about your soul is you have a metaphysic. So this stuff is in some sense real to you, to paraphrase 
you know, um, Gaius Maximus from Gladiator, what you do here echoes in eternity. So there is a very real pact or transaction with what you are, what you consider acceptable to get some of the things you want. Okay. And that has only become more acute rather than less at the moment. The goodish news, when you think about that, when you kind of position on a moral or soul centric basis around anti war as like, this is it, right? This, this absolutely has to be it, is um, this ends, like the war cycle ends. That's kind of the the consolation of a cycle model is um, that it ends. But also propaganda, the, the failure of propaganda always precedes regime change. Now, if you look at the bizarre statements um, the U.S. is making in the Security Council, if you look at Theresa May not going to Parliament to get permission, same thing with the U.S. for the airstrikes and so on, they know what they're saying is wrong. They know nobody believes it. And so they're trying to, their propaganda has failed. They're trying to achieve the objectives despite the propaganda failing. And every time it happens, it makes it worse. Fewer and fewer people believe them with each of these steps. So that's kind of the goodish news. Like that is good, right? But what it does mean is as the political authority for essentially Western governmental structures erodes, it will take a lot of things with it, right? So uh, it, <laughs> something Catherine Fitz mentions that if you like 50% of US capital flows are in some way tied to the federal budget, you have pensions, you have military pensions, you have government contractors, you have all this kind of money that if you if you were to collapse the federal government, you reduce capital flows in your area by about 50%. So that's what I mean by it being goodish news. Um, <clears throat> we will, and it's because, again, cycles post-2015.75. We are past a point where at each step, um, the, the kind of magic of authority gets weaker and weaker. Um, goodish. But something you need to navigate, like you need to look, and we'll, we'll come to this when we get to the steps, right? You need to look at what your exposure is to structures that are, if not eroding, becoming generally less effective. So the West is effectively, we're descending into farce, or perhaps a better way of describing that is the farcical nature <laughs> of the Western system is moving from, you know, to paraphrase Jung, the unconscious to the conscious. And this is what I mean about facing the answer. Like, what's to be done? You go, Look, how do you fix this? Who, who would you replace? Um, where, where, where are you going to find the moral authority in a major party anywhere in the West to go, ah, right, fixed. It is structurally eroding. And it's going to take some essential things with it. Okay? Face the answer. Don't find it. Um, we're not at that point in the timeline. Again, it's goodish news because hopefully our, you know, bloody adventurisms over the last couple of centuries will diminish as, uh, as the US in particular at the moment takes its place in a multipolar world. So post-2030, we have to get to 2030 without, um, you know, essentially Washington Warhawks panicking about the fact that we're moving into a multipolar world and, and bombing great parts of it, right? Um, so moving it from that kind of macro of philosophy embedded in metaphysics, like, like how to live in the world, down to a, a personal level. How to describe this? So one of the founders of permaculture, he was raised by socialist activists and so on, and in particular with his last couple of books, he's 
been essentially rethinking activism. Uh, and it's a good way of describing that, right? So, and I'm not sure, I'm not even sure how much of it is a rethink. From about the 70s onwards, uh, activist groups and revolutionary groups, particularly on the left, have done a fairly vigorous job of critiquing revolution and revolutionary groups and so on. Um, revolution doesn't work. And it's because revolutionary groups are suspect. Like, you, we kind of all know this, but uh, you have this sort of evangelized, utopian, essentially Christian solutionism behind a, a group effort to sort of storm the castle, take over, and so on. It, it became apparent that meet the new boss, same with the old boss, is kind of baked into groups in general. And so that idea has been very vigorously critiqued since about the 70s. And uh, in particular, and I think this is important, there is the observation, for instance, that the state creates the conditions for revolutionary groups in the first place because of various dissatisfactions and so on. So that by definition, revolutionaries are functions of the state. They don't exist in non-state societies, which means the kind of collectivist action that comes from this 19th century solutionism, this sort of utopian view, isn't a good enough match for today's conditions. Now, <clears throat> So that kind of, this is all, as far as I'm concerned, settled in the 70s, right? But the more modern, I guess, Marxist soul for this is essentially to lionize endless critique. You kind of trap yourself uh, when you realize that revolutionary groups are functions of the state and they don't actually solve anything. And this is that weird Jordan Peterson thing to which he's correct. At some point, once the realities of the Soviet system became apparent, you go, okay, well, that's clearly not going to work. And uh, they generally fall back on endless critique. Uh, and because you fall back on the one thing you can do, you tend to inflate its value. Now, critique is useful, uh, but it's probably not as useful as uh, it's described. And this is a side effect of something I talk about all the time, um, which is the generally flawed metaphysics of the left. They do come out of this materialist positivist solutionism of the 19th century. Uh, and that's flawed because magic, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. So it seems to me an urgent case needs to be made, going back to what I was saying about permaculture, to rethink activism. In a world where your opinion doesn't matter, which we know, we're, like no one is... <laughs> Uh, no one is, is pro-bombing Syria, as far as I can tell. Literally no one. And yet, you know, two-thirds of the West is, is, is attempting or is doing it. So, <clears throat> arguably, your opinion has never mattered. But that's really more visible now. That's the kind of other side of the coin of the failure of propaganda. Uh, and this is why anti-war, it's another reason why anti-war needs to be the cornerstone of where you position yourselves politically. It has really been the only protest that historically America has considered seditious. So if you look at the black Marxists that were protesting the draft and, and so on, it wasn't the Marxism or the blackness at the time. It was as soon as they went after the war. As soon as they said this is a white man's war, that's when they get imprisoned. Same thing with Dr. King, uh, which I kind of mentioned a couple of newsletters ago. Um, everyone, <laughs> the New York intelligentsia loved him until he started speaking out about Vietnam. So that kind of tells you a lot about why you need to be anti-war and, and also what, what it is they're most scared of. Uh, and it is as far as I can tell, and I've been thinking about this and talking about it with friends um, offline and so on, it is the sole signifier of, or the sole universal, of an authentic left position, which, <laughs> which it actually shares with the 40% of libertarians that aren't racist or crypto republicans. Uh, and this in some respects, shouldn't be surprising, as Marx's utopian vision didn't end in Leninism. Um, it actually ended in, in essentially an anarcho-libertarianism. His, his utopia or his vision for how the, the 20th century would go was that basically 
you would use an interventionist command economy to forcefully eliminate class differences and and perfect the use of labor. And at that point, being useless, the state would just dissolve away into this peaceful global paradise of stateless togetherness, which is, of course, idiotic, right? It's one of the many silly things in his belief system. Now, nevertheless, uh, the anti-war component, as I said, that is shared between the 40% of libertarians that don't make me queasy and what I would consider to be polyvalent authentic left voices suggest that authentic left voices need to put on their big girl galoshes and, and cross the road and, and start talking to these libertarians, the good ones, because um, in a funny way, they, they, they're intending to end up in the same place. And, uh, and it's quite clear, I think, to everyone that the steps to get there will not involve the state at the moment. It's, it's not dissolving, but it's authority and competence is. So um, I think that's it for the political position kind of component of it. So that's kind of at a group level. So we've gone sort of national. These are my notes as I put them together. So we've got like on a cosmic or national or international level down to how you think with this as groups. And then on the, on the personal level, this is where the magic comes in. Because on the personal level, you go metaphysics first. When looking at the increasing, well, when looking at the uptrend of the war cycle, it probably won't, but the world might end in a nuclear conflagration <laughs> by 2021, right? Like, I don't, that's a, it's alarming to say that that's a non zero possibility. I consider it a minority uh, possibility. I think, um, I think probably if you're listening to this in the West, you will essentially survive it. But a lot of people are going to die between now and 2021 as this Arab force thing happens and, and whatever. So you may be all right. You may not, um, but you may be all right. Uh, but nevertheless, you, you kind of have to get your head around um, the non-zero risks. And for me, that inevitably begins with metaphysics. Step one, as you saw in the chaos protocols, solve for invincibility. And this is what you need to be operating in that wider cosmic moral sense. But you also need to solve for invincibility. So in the non-zero chance that you do die in a nuclear conflagration, and I can't believe I'm saying these things, uh, how you make fear small and how you just continue to function because arguably the greatest sin, which we'll come to, is giving in to fear and having it alter your way of being in the world, is to realize death isn't the end, and to viscerally realize it, hence becoming invincible. And so that's the, that's the personal step, step one in the metaphysics. The next step is... I've written this as seek refuge in the sanctity of the entire cosmos. Everything that happens, your kid eating ice cream for the first time, bombs falling on Damascus, is an experience undergone by the universe. So this is the, this is the macro to the micro of becoming invincible, right? Which is... And it's, it's uh, you need to think with and through this, because if you get it wrong, you end up with everything happens for a reason, or, you know, it's their karma, or all of these kind of fascist garbage ideas. Um, you need to have an understanding of the holy not meaning nice, but that the cosmos itself, the entire thing, the whole enchilada is sacred. Okay. Uh, and is animate. So it's the kind of other sign of your, your invincibility. Now, where both of these two things come together, as I said, is around not giving in to fear. So you know that you cannot be destroyed. So as all this bad stuff happens, 
like all the demons of hell can't even scratch the paint on your true self unless you let them and the sequence of of being that sort of the secret uh, the secret of living like that in the world is invincibility in a sacred cosmos right so you begin with the metaphysics and then we come back to that morality as i sort of mentioned um However you describe it now, your soul is in play. It is just inarguable. You can't compartmentalize because you know how politics and, and so on works. You can't compartmentalize, oh, I like this about a major party, but I don't like the other thing, so I'm going to vote for them. That's not the deal on the table. You have to ask yourself, how many Arab children does each midterm election promise cost? So what's the amount of children you are prepared to pay for a new road or a transgender bathroom? You cannot functionally separate them when you effectively have a system where corporate interest will pay money to people running for office because they want certain things, and these people running for office will turn around and make the promises to you that are most likely to get them elected to fulfill these corporate promises. They are inextricably tied together. So every time you look at a major candidate and what they are promising you in any country in the West, ask how many Arab children you're prepared to pay for it. That's the system. And the necessary flow on from that, as we do head into elections in different countries around the world at different times, is find out who in your area has said what about Syrian interventionism and Gaza and Palestinians and the rest of it. And if you have to, you cross the fucking floor and you vote for someone on the other side of a major party. By the way, you won't actually have to do that because they're singing from the same hymn sheet. And my preference is I keep saying, if you have a green candidate, the only credible anti-war party in the three countries under discussion at the moment, um, vote for them. But this is, this is the deal. That's what you're paying. Your soul is on the line. Uh, I, between now and 2021, a lot of people are going to die. This is getting pretty grim, isn't it? Your soul is on the line. Let me just, I don't know how you want to describe it, but that's where we are. Um, that's the US version of it. In the UK, having just said that about the Green Party, you're, you're unfortunate in that you have Theresa May as a prime minister, but you are fortunate that you probably have the only leader of a major party who has credible and believable, crucially, anti-war positions. So the challenge is different in the UK. In Australia, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Uh, we don't set our own foreign policy anyway. That's set in Washington and London. And we can't set our own economic policy because the economy is too small. This is why I focus on areas where my focus on the US and the UK is, and I sort of said this at the events in Sydney last year, that is the Australian focus. If you were looking for the formation of Australian foreign and economic policy, you don't look in Canberra. Same thing for New Zealand and any of the other countries who are, who are listening to this. And the third thing you have to do, and this is moral rather than anything else, um, tell people. It's interesting to look. I remember this from having proper jobs. Uh, if you look at the percentage of people who do things like read a book a year, which I believe is only about 18% of the population in the West. One book a year. Uh, same thing for podcasts. Um, who has listened to a nonfiction podcast? It's around the same. It's like between 20 and 35% of the population has. So congratulations. If you're listening to this, you're an intellectual. Uh, so tell people. And by tell people, I don't mean yell at them. Uh, I don't mean yell at them about their soul <laughs> like I'm doing to you. Sorry. Tell people in the sense of let them have the discussion. Um, it is, it's kind of, and have the discussion with them. It's challenging to, if you're coming to this new, and a lot of people are, a lot of people are waking up to, well, goodness, this murderous, bloodthirsty mechanism that we're all in 
did we all know this was happening? Is this how it's always been? And you have to go, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> but make the space for the discussion. This is actually how you do that, that decentral waking up or beginning the counter trend of, of the war cycle, right? So those are your kind of steps. Uh, Position yourself around anti-war as the sole defining issue and let that unfold into your political engagement. Let that unfold into your personal engagement um, with other humans and, and so on. And then I want to look at essentially the personal risk analysis around capital market impacts, particularly debt and pensions, which I know people find boring but again much like the 50 percent of capital flows being tied to the federal government in your area um a consequence of the erosion of confidence in these western structures is going to land in debt markets and pensions and so on um this is boring stuff but like libor is already um, heading to the moon, so the London interbank um, lending rates are heading to the moon, um, which means central banks will follow them with their interest rates. In Australia, for instance, uh, our essentially our Fed, so our Reserve Bank, uh, is stress testing banks at a seven percent interest rate. So that's a jump of about five percent, and they don't do that unless they need to do that. So look at your own personal risk analysis from where your money comes from, from an employment perspective, from a pension perspective, uh, and look at your debt obligations and essentially triple the <laughs> interest rate that you are looking to pay for it and then make adjustments accordingly. Or if not adjustments, at least have a hypothetical bug out bag. So... I've had these chats with people and, and premium members and so on, which is the majority of people out there listening to this will have a mortgage and they'll have kids in a school and their job will be tied to their place in their house and so on. You go, that's fine. Where, where are your closest friends? Um, where are family members? What would you do if, like, what's the fallback position? What's your, um, what's Helm's Deep? Who... Whose house do you all live in? Like, again, it's a worst case scenario, much like you might die in a nuclear conflagration. It may not happen, but you need a hypothetical economic bug out bag, which is how would we do this in a worst case scenario? Uh, and it's worth just spending an hour thinking about that. Uh, maybe having the discussion with, with people involved. We obviously. As a family, um, we've done that, which is what do we do? Um, what, what, what's the zombie apocalypse scenario, right? Um, you're going to need to do that because I don't, it, we're heading into a serious debt incident. It's a question, much like the war cycle, of just how serious that's going to get. Uh, and so I have to tell you to do that. I have to tell you, you need to look at this stuff. I guess, and this is the, the thing we chatted about with the premium members last week, invent positive medium-term futures is the right way of thinking about it. There's, um, it's a counter trend, isn't it? So as things get worse, you have to get better. We've begun having these discussions around what that might look like, what the implications are for art and literature and so on. As we head into dystopia, you need to point at utopia. Now, neither of these things will actually happen. That's not their literary and creative function. But we need to be looking at and inventing positive medium-term futures. We need to be creating that with art. We need to be discussing it and thinking about it as, as families and groups of friends and, and all this kind of stuff. And this is a really simple New Age approach. But the way to start from that is as you're listening to this or as you go through the process of working out how to think with a rising war cycle and 
to think with, you know, the debt situation that we're going to be heading into, which, by the way, will be largely engineered and so on, just approach these issues from a higher mind. And I, I've kind of given this technique or discussed it with premium members, but you can just say higher mind. You can take a deep breath and say that as you are facing challenging situations or when you attempted to respond with hostility. And there is something about saying higher mind that will put you in a higher mind and in a situation where you are better equipped to navigate the challenges. The same thing can apply f when it comes to medium-term scenario planning, uh, creating art, and so on. You need, you need a way, and it, it almost kind of rocks you back on your heels of your invincibility. So here, here is how you activate that, because you can go through the ritual process and and viscerally experience your immortality, well, not immortality, invincibility. Um, but how you activate that is you don't have to use the higher mind technique. You might have another one, but um, it works. It works really well. And you're going to need that because there is, and it's the other side of the wider moral implications, and we'll, we'll close on this. Uh, Okay, again, uh, something I've mentioned before. When she was alive, Sylvia Brown, who I know is contentious with some of you for reasons that I think are silly, uh, came to Australia several times, and so I'd been to see her. And I can attest that she was the real deal from a clairvoyance perspective. Uh, and one of the things she said was, what's the big deal? Like, so what if the world ends? Um, the worst thing that happens is that the tunnel is crowded, right? And uh, and that's that's a woman who is invincible. That's an attitude that, in in some sense, and she said it for laughs. Obviously, it's not murderous. But I think there's another side to it, which is maybe a bit more magically inclined, which is don't have regrets in a crowded tunnel. The reason. I'm doing this show isn't, as I kind of said, to warn people or to unpick the he said, she said of, um, these, you know, farcical geopolitics. It's to make them small. Um, it's to make them manageable on a personal basis. Um, you know, as I said, very unlikely, but we might die in a nuclear conflagration. If we don't, you nevertheless will one day die. And don't have regrets in the tunnel. Um, find a way to morally be in the universe and navigate this increasing war cycle, but don't get paralyzed by the fear. Make the world generally better <laughs> than you found it and, and live your fucking life. Um, there's only so many things, and this is why we wanted to talk about the activism and so on, that you as a single human can materially impact. Uh, and much as I suspect in a metaphoric sense, you will answer to St. Peter or Osiris or whatever for the position you took in the face of increasing death and destruction in the Middle East. You will also be forced to defend what you did with your life. Uh, and that's, funnily enough, the positive message to end on, which is the way through this is not to avoid the challenges of the world, it's to face them, it's to face the answer, um, to take that moral position, and then essentially make the fear small. And out of the moral position, and out of the metaphysical position, live your life. Live your life and make sure you don't have regrets in the tunnel. So uh, so that's enough. <laughs> that's enough for this week. I don't know if you could hear the dawn chorus behind me as I was recording this, but uh, it's very early morning here, which means um, I won't be able to 
you know, smash a third of a bottle of tequila, which, uh, depending on when you're listening to this, you are more than welcome to do. This was a challenging episode, but we kind of had to do it, right? There's points of discussion that need to be put out there and thoughts that we need to think with individually and as a group. And, uh, and uh, that's what this one was about. So thank you for listening. Normal programming once again returns next week. And, uh, and that's it. Until next time. <laughs>